All right, so let's let's jump into micro slicing, right? Let's talk about that. This is uh, a patented technology that uh, we believe truly brings the sophistication of cellular LTE and 5G technology to the fore within the enterprise context. So some of the key drivers of why enterprises are actually looking at private mobile, private LTE and private 5G is because they expect this technology to deliver wired-like reliability with a wireless technology. So put another way, uh, it takes lets you take the advantage of all the flexibility and the mobility features that we've all loved, we've all you know grown to love and take for granted <laughs> on a wireless network. Uh, and now using the same network, you can actually guarantee SLAs to critical applications that you're running on it. And this is where slicing and micro slicing comes into picture. So those of you who are familiar with, uh, with the cellular world uh, have probably heard of the concept of network slicing. So cellular world has a concept of network slicing uh, that allows them to deliver QoS guarantees to enterprises that they offer their services to. What we have done is we have, again, built on top of the, the existing standards and made it granular to the point of devices and applications, because end of the day, from an enterprise perspective, what they care about is their applications and the devices that are running uh, those applications. So when you create a micro slice, and again, you'll see this uh, in, a, in a demo soon, uh, when you create a micro slice on the Salona orchestrator, what that truly does, it, uh, it basically takes into account the application that is part of that micro slice, the device group that will be running uh, as part of that micro slice, and actually creates uh, a slice, a resource slice for that application, for those devices, both on the RAN as well as on the core network. So what that does is within the context of the private mobile network now, if you, let's say, are running a computer vision application and you have this video slice that you want to create in order to ensure that you, have, you want to deliver a very specific latency or you want to keep the latency under a certain limit, now you create that slice, you, <clears throat> the, the system identifies the application flow, you add device groups to that micro slice and you tell any application flow, any video uh, flow coming from these set of devices need to adhere to this set of SLAs, whether it's throughput, latency or packet error rate. And the system is able to do that for you within the context of the private mobile network. And then the second part of the equation is this also allows you to now integrate with existing enterprise systems. Enterprise already have these cameras running over their existing access networks. You are introducing a new access network. So how does all of this fit into the existing network infrastructure? How does it fit into the existing security policies that you probably have already defined? And that's again, where micro slicing comes into picture. So you have your video slice that I talked about earlier. You're delivering the SLA for that within the private mobile network context, but you also are now able to take that and plug it back into the existing VLANs, existing segmentation policies that you have for those devices and for those application flows. And this is where from an enterprise perspective, it starts to become real because it is fitting into what they have already built out. It is not creating a separate island network, which in the past uh, cellular networks have tried to do within the enterprise. And uh, this is where the appeal for micro slicing really, really uh, uh, starts to uh, resonate with what enterprises are looking for and trying to deliver with uh, application SLA. And now if I take the concept of micro, of micro slicing, I tie it back to what I said earlier about APIs and programmability of the network and the AI ops engine that we are, we are slowly kind of building towards with all the different deployments and data that's coming in, we now have or are driving towards a point where the system is able to automatically obviously identify the application flows and classify them. It's able to look at the individual performance metrics of different applications that are running on your private mobile network and identify the ones which are probably not performing as well as they should by maybe comparing it to other networks or doing some kind of benchmarking with other private mobile networks where Salona might be deployed, identifying <clears throat> non-performing applications or applications that might be having poor end user experience, picking those applications and now recommending 
the kind of micro slice that will benefit those applications, right? And start with recommendations and at some point start to fine tune the parameters so you can create a micro slice for these poor performing applications and then start to deliver the SLA that these applications need and constantly monitor that so that if there's any deviation from that baseline, you can go back and fine tune the network in order to continuously deliver the KPI and the SLA for that application. So this is how micro slicing, the programmability and the API aspect of it, all of it is now coming together in order to deliver the, the application SLA that, uh, that the enterprises are, are looking for from a private mobile network. Do you, have a, do you have a practical real world example where folks are deploying micro slicing by any yeah, chance? Absolutely, absolutely. So if you think about these, uh, uh, one of the examples is you have a warehouse, right? You have a warehouse, you have different applications that they're running on this private mobile network. Now they have these AG, AGVs, autonomous guided vehicles that are uh, uh, zooming around at maybe 20, 20 miles an hour and need to be connected to the network. And they are constantly sending control uh, signaling traffic back and forth from the server to the actual autonomous guided vehicle that is running on the factory floor. Now you want to make sure that that particular control traffic uh, always has an always has a certain level of latency, irrespective of what other kind of traffic that might be running on the network. And now you're if you create a micro slice for that signaling traffic, and you say that hey, this particular signaling traffic it is latency sensitive traffic, and I want the latency to be below a certain number and you create that slice, now you're able to ensure that that control traffic always adheres to that latency SLA and the AGVs do not necessarily stop midway in their operation. So that's one use case. Another one that comes to mind is uh, Zoom actually. So in a K through 12 smart community kind of a use case where they're deploying these outdoor CBRS uh, networks, uh, you are using outdoor, you're using these fixed wireless backhauls to provide connectivity to students who might not, who might be now uh, uh, trying to access content and trying to access content from their homes, right? And you're trying to provide connectivity and bridge the digital divide. So there's a lot of those use cases coming out. And in this case, you want to make sure that the Zoom traffic, which is the most critical for that particular scenario and that use case, you are able to identify the Zoom traffic and you're able to make sure that you have the resources, whether it's bandwidth and latency dedicated for that particular application, irrespective of what others in the house that uh, might be using the network for, right? So these are some two use cases that immediately come to my mind. And again, happy to see if others uh, from my, our team have uh, yeah. other use cases. Yeah, I guess my question goes, and again, sort of, I live in the Wi-Fi world, right? And so I'm having a hard time translating what that, mm -hmm. how that equates. But in in the Wi-Fi world, of course, right, on iOS devices, we can say, hey, tag this application properly as the frame leaves the device on the Wi-Fi network. I, I don't know, is there an equivalent on the, on the CBRS cell side of the world? Or is that something, is that all done by application inspection? And we know that, that this packet is a Zoom packet, therefore we're going to prioritize it or what? Yeah, so I think the big difference here is that on the on the on the Wi-Fi side, right? Uh, there there has been development on the QoS side, but a lot of the decision is being made by the client and the application, right? On the cellular side, the way it's being done is all the scheduling decisions are actually happening on the network side. So the network is actually deciding when a client sends or when a client doesn't send uh, data over the over the RF medium. Right, and because the, the the network is actually scheduling all of that, it is able to prioritize the application that I guess in this case the orchestrator is telling the network to prioritize. But is that is that really as granular as hey, a device wants to send uh, two packets? One's a Zoom packet, one's an email packet, and the infrastructure says, "Hang on to your email packet, but send me the Zoom packet instead." Absolutely, absolutely. So what it does really? is there's That's a concept, awesome. there's a concept of dedicated bearers and default bearers that end up getting created, right? So in case of a, a micro slice, when you create a micro slice, you actually have dedicated bearers that are getting created for device and for the application on that device. So yes, it is happening at the granularity of individual device and the application flows on that device, which is what makes it really, really powerful. Uh, that, that, that is something new that I did not know before. Phenomenal, thank you. Perfect.
So, uh, so I would just want to bring all of this together. <laughs> we have talked about <clears throat> the Salona edge, the core being deployed where the applications are. And again, as we see, here's a real example of applications, let's say an AR VR app, which is <clears throat> latency sensitive, being deployed on the enterprise edge, the compute infrastructure that's available there. You have certain other applications which can tolerate latency, but but uh, need to be deployed in the cloud or in the Metro edge. So you have real examples of applications being deployed in all of these different locations. Now you have the ability as Mark showed us to have Salona edge being deployed right alongside the application, as well as the security services that might be deployed there. You have <clears throat> all the different devices that we talked about, the growing ecosystem of devices, whether it's mobile phones, whether it is uh, uh, ruggedized tablets, whether it is AGVs, whether it is, uh, uh, the dongles that somebody was excited about. So all of these different devices connecting to the network and now micro slicing kind of ties all of this together where you're now able to take your critical devices, take your critical applications, no matter where they're deployed and deliver the application SLA uh, irrespective of being completely uh, uh, agnostic of where the application is and where the devices are. So I think this is, this picture kind of brings all of the things that we have talked about so far together. And I'll hand it over to, to Ozer next so that uh, uh, we can actually see this in action as well. So over to you, Ozer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, really quick here. Sorry, quick question. Um, so a little bit off subject, but like when it comes to the air interface, like when it comes to designing and optimizing like those private networks, are they more on the Wi-Fi side, like kind of design or like the cellular network design? And what type of tools you're going to be using for designing and optimizing them? Perfect, perfect. I think I'll, I'll let Andrew handle it. He's uh, he's doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think I would let him kind of talk through what does the day zero prior to uh, pre-design look like and what does day zero day one look like from a, from a private mobile network perspective within the enterprise. Andrew, do you want to take that? Yep, thanks, Puneet, um, and happy to field this question. I'm Andrew Vanaj, uh, Director of Solutions Engineering at Salona, essentially a field technical resource on the team. Um, so designing CBRS networks follows a very similar workflow and process flow that you would do with Wi-Fi. We need to cover the same high-level objectives of what coverage areas do we need, what quality of signal do we need in those areas, uh, how do we design for handover and mobility, how do we design with capacity in mind, but how we get from point A to point B is a little bit different because there's a little bit different metrics uh, that we use between what Wi-Fi does as a protocol and what LTE and 5G do as protocols and how they measure quality and how they uh, get to that end goal. So what we're looking at right now uh, is outdoor, there's much more, uh, much higher power output. And typically we have a different metrics like RSRP, uh, that we're using to measure signal quality rather than RSSI. And RSRP, for instance, is measuring uh, on a single antenna uh, on a, a small control subcarrier of 15 kilohertz wide within the band. And, you know, so how LTE as a protocol uses the, the carrier or the, the channel is fundamentally different than how Wi-Fi uses it. So it's measurements and how it gets to the signal qualities are a little bit different. Um, so we're using a little bit different tool sets as well. So outdoors, we're looking at, uh, you know, we need to understand the terrain and topography and we need to understand um, the heights of where we're mounting much more crucially because with higher output power at like 50, um, 50 watts per 10 megahertz, we can go potentially multiple miles. And so earth bulge and uh, clutter data and acquiring clutter data and getting that into a software tool is completely different than people typically do with Wi-Fi. So uh, the tool sets for outdoor are completely different. On the indoor side, it's very similar to what you may be familiar with on the Wi-Fi side. We're importing blueprints, drawing walls, making sure the input data to that tool is, that, is as accurate as possible. Um, and then placing our access points, orienting them properly, and then leveraging the underlying propagation modeling of the software tool with those LTE and 5G differences in mind, like I talked about a minute ago, to understand what coverage looks like, where handover needs to occur within an indoor space, 
and to make sure those, those the capacity is, is met as well. So the tool sets are different, the metrics are different, but the high level process is very consistent with what you might be used to from a Wi-Fi perspective. From a design perspective, how, how you know, when we think about, you know, three and a half gigahertz, right, that it's in between 2.4 and 5. And so we sort of envision what these cell sizes approximately might look like. Are you seeing cell sizes similar to the Wi-Fi world? Or are you seeing ENOBs, you know, uh, at a much smaller density, largely because of coverage cells and all that? Yeah. Or, or are they just completely not even equatable? It's it's really apples and oranges mainly do again. So from a RF raw RF perspective, you'd think they're similar bands. They have the same similar propagation uh, and free space path loss and attenuation characteristics. And while that's true, uh, how LTE structures the channel specifically with subcarriers, control channels, uh, and how it uses OFDMA differently than Wi-Fi completely means there's different. Uh, amounts of spectrum, those subcarrier levels that they get allocated to clients for transmission slots up, uplink and downlink. And so that translates into different noise floors. A 15 kilohertz subcarrier has a much different noise floor than a 20 megahertz wide channel. And so what you see is typically in indoors, we're seeing roughly analogous, uh, you know, 10,000 to 20,000 square feet of coverage or roughly four Wi-Fi APs for every one CBRS AP. Now that's a very can... rough estimate, but it, and it varies based on the, the facility. But and then outdoors with the much higher power output at, at 50 watts per 10 megahertz, which would be 53 for a 20 megahertz carrier. Uh, we yeah, we're seeing multiple miles pretty you know, depending on the client side as well, much larger range, typically 10x of what Wi-Fi could could achieve. And you can just... use those 15 kilohertz subcarriers individually, unlike in the Wi-Fi world where you've got to spread it out across the beacon or whatever, right? Um yeah, so the, the infrastructure that put, uh, and the scheduling that Puneet mentioned with the infrastructure controlling it, it'll allocate clients uh, specific um, amounts of, of subcarriers in, within a, a physical resource block. And it's just, again, how it's structured in OFDMA. Clients can have a specific number of subcarriers allotted to them based on their, their need for, for bandwidth or latency and, and how, how, many, how much of the resources they need. So it's, it's not one client's getting the full 20 megahertz and then another client's getting the full 20 megahertz. It's we're packing them in on different subcarriers allotted to what they need. Andrew, what if you share with them the SNR that you can work in? It's, it was shocking me the first time I figured it out. Yeah, so within a 15 kilohertz subcarrier, the, the thermal noise floor is somewhere around negative 135 dBm. Uh, you take in the, the receiver noise figure of about 6 dB uh, typical. And so you're looking at a noise floor somewhere in the neg 125 to neg 30, neg 130 dBm range Crimin. as the noise floor. Um, I do want to add, of course, as we in 5G go also including a 60 kilohertz subcarrier spacing for small cells that starts to approach very much what you're seeing in Wi-Fi 802.11ax when you have a 78.125 uh, then then you get similarity but if but just so you know there is a 60 kilohertz subcarrier also supported in these bands. 